When it comes to worrying about completing a backlog of video games to play and movies to watch, I feel like I've kind of worked past that fear. I guess the crippling fear of dying makes me worry about not being able to experience all of the valuable and worthwhile media out there if I think about it a little too long, but when it comes to those hard-hitting labels, I've kind of adopted the notion that whatever is truly special will come to me and stick with me. Going off of that mantra for the past few years now has done wonders for my sanity, actually. That's why I didn't force myself to actually finish any video game or any other piece of media this year. I let the stories tell themselves, and if they grabbed me, they grabbed me. It made me feel more like an accomplishment if they actually earned my time, which I find to be the most valuable thing at the end of the day. At the beginning of 2023, I had a thought. That usually leads to nothing in particular when it comes to me, but this time I wanted to really make something of it. My thought was, what if I recorded literally every piece of media I consumed over the next 365 days in an extensive spreadsheet and then made a video about the experience and my thoughts on each one at the end of the year? How would this experience alter the way that I choose to consume media? I feel like I already waste so much of my time on social media like TikTok and Twitter, but that I could be allocating that time to more productive things. Would I become more introspective? Would I gain more valuable knowledge about being able to decipher which pieces of media are worth my time and which are not? These are all questions I wanted answered so I could have a more valuable and worthwhile 2024. And that's how this monstrosity happened. I recorded every video game I played and didn't finish, movies I watched and enjoyed or didn't, every TV show I partook in the viewing of, and all of the manga I read, of the few I did read this year. This video will be split into parts based on category, and I'll leave timestamps for each part in the description. This list doesn't exclude media that was released outside of 2023, by the way. It includes everything, as long as I engaged with it for the first time this year. This is probably going to be really embarrassing outing how hard it is for me to finish a video game, but I'm doing it anyways because I think it'll be fun. Without any further interruptions, let's start with video game. Tears of the Kingdom. Okay, so due to my own stupidity, I barely even made it past the tutorial of this game. Malcolm, do you remember when we played Tears of the Kingdom together and I had the controls? Yes, I do. How would you describe the way I chose to solve the puzzles? Well, imagine you could go in a straight line. This straight line is something that I'm like, hey, you can go in a straight line. And you look to me and you say, no. And so you head diagonally and then backwards. And then once you head backwards, you accidentally fall off the cliff. You restart. You're like, okay, 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 let's let's try this again. Um, and then I remind you, hey, we could go straight. No. So then you retry. And you keep going. Wahoo! 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 Can we get his toes to do that thing again? The thing is, what that's doing is it's trying to make it so Link's feet orientate with any angle of the surface, Oh, no. Right? So, whenever, uh, try not to go underneath that. Uh, I don't recommend that. But yeah, so basically whenever there's a log there and the surface is kind of rounded, Link's feet is always trying to kind of, like, adjust, and so it does that little, like, flapping shit. Yeah. See another, I, another I think you fish. somehow managed to find yourself in the middle between two logs where there's a curve downwards but also a curve upwards. <laughs> His right? feet are and broken. So, yeah. Oh man, that looks like it hurts. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait, we're yeah. just breaking the game already? Or is this this isn't normal? Uh, no, that's a feature, and in most cases, it looks normal, but in this case... <laughs> Ooh. <clears throat> I'm on a boat with a couple of wackos. Dipping Shake. in the water? <laughs> Shaking my hips. And dipping my fat toe in the water. Raised eyebrow? <laughs> Dipping in the water. This part is getting harder. It's so hard, it's stupid. What? No, we can't be stupid. 
Yeah. I remain under the impression that my methods are completely justified. I just haven't been able to get into Zelda since they switched to the Breath of the Wild-like open world games. I miss the linear, cohesive, and engaging storylines of the older games. Yeah, I'm one of those fans. Sue me. Yohane the Parhelion, Blaze in the Deep Blue. This game was a little challenging for me as someone who doesn't play Metroidvanias all that often, but it broadened my horizons a little since I got the chance to play it. The pixel backgrounds were beautiful, and the enemy and boss designs really surprised me with how intimidating they looked, considering this is a Love Live game. I adore Love Live, and I also adore how much effort they've put into this Yohane spin-off series. The dialogue and overall story was a little bit lacking, but the gameplay was pretty addicting. I'm looking forward to seeing more come out of this series. 7 out of 10. Sonic Frontiers. Okay, full disclosure, I haven't finished this game yet, and I haven't played any of the new updates yet. I believe I got to the second island, you know, the one where you save Knuckles. I did have a nice time running around as Sonic in an open world, it felt quite freeing, and just felt good to do. I need to be better about making my own fun in video games, I guess. I've always struggled with that. I enjoyed replaying the cyberspace stages to try to get a higher grade, with my resident Sonic expert's advice. But I don't think I'd be motivated to keep playing if he wasn't there with me, to be honest. Even though my friends were literally trapped in a red sizzling crystal of death, I didn't really feel an urgency to progress. The first island was mostly peaceful to traverse through, besides the enemies that were annoying to defeat because I suck at video games. I liked that the first area's environment was relaxing to be in, but then they dropped me in a desert and it no longer had that effect. I really loved the moments between Sonic, Amy, and even Knuckles that I saw. The new delivery of the characters' voices went in a way that kind of felt a little too forced. I realize in games like Sonic Colors, their voices technically were forced too, in an off-the-charts goofy way, but the voices in Sonic Frontiers were forced in the opposite direction, where it's almost too edgy. I realize I sound like I'm one of those fans that can never be pleased here, and I want to say that it's not that bad. I guess I just prefer when Sonic and Co. are a little more cheesy, not like Sonic Colors levels of cheesiness where you can tell they're trying way too hard, but enough where it's silly and that they're taking themselves seriously in a wacky plot that involves outer space and the President of the United States. Let's just say it got to the point where I genuinely preferred just fishing with Big instead of doing anything else the game offered me that would help me progress. I'll need to continue playing Sonic Frontiers to gather a more complete opinion on it, but as of now, that's where I stand on this one. Fire Emblem Engage. I share this sentiment with some of my other friends. This game really isn't holding my interest compared to previous Fire Emblem titles. Exploring the Somniel becomes boring after the first two or three times you run through it. What binds me to Fire Emblem games are their quirky, fun characters, and an overarching story connecting all of them together. I can't even remember what the story of this game was about. I stopped playing at chapter 19, I believe. At the beginning I was actually enjoying meeting the characters and playing the game. The maps are certainly complex and entertaining this time around, especially the paralogues. Those took the most of my brain power to figure out. It was nothing less of what I expected from intelligent systems. I know they can really cook when it comes to strategy gameplay. It was also really entertaining to grind up my favorite characters and watch them interact. My standout favorites that I still remember today are Anna, Tamera, Vagato, Yunaka, Zaytrine, and Rosado, my beloved. I simply adore Brian Timothy Anderson's voice performance for Rosado. However, the rest of them, and especially the villains, were just so forgettable at best and irritating at worst. That really brought down the quality of the game overall, since I've noticed that having a really good villain can really carry your narrative. This game's basic fantasy plotline just wasn't giving. Minecraft. I've played a little Minecraft in the past, but this year was the year where I actually tried to play Minecraft. Until now, the most I've done in the game is create simple pixel art and creative, and follow other people around, being a bird and friend who you have to feed and keep alive. Some people may say that there is no wrong way to play Minecraft, but for some reason every time I played it, I felt like I was always doing it wrong. I know, how do you fuck up even Minecraft? I genuinely feel like part of the problem of me never being able to actually enjoy and get into Minecraft is that issue I have that I was talking about before. I'm not creative enough to make my own fun in these kinds of games, especially not when the aesthetics of Minecraft in general aren't very appealing to me, so I feel little to no motivation to play. However, I did make a little bakery with help, if you could call it that this year, and I did think it looked fairly cute. Not like super cute, but like kinda cute. And after realizing that that was the extent of cuteness I would ever be able to achieve from this game, I lost interest yet again. To me, it feels like there is both everything and nothing at all in Minecraft at the same time. 5.5 out of 10. Samba de Amigo. One night this year, I fired up the first Samba de Amigo game for the Dreamcast from the year of our lord 2000. 
as expected, it served immaculate 2000s era vibes. I just would have hoped for even more songs to play and stages to enjoy, but I guess that's asking a bit too much from a 23 year old video game. Unfortunately, I haven't played Party Central yet, but I do really want to try it out for comparison's sake. To me, it felt like that game didn't get nearly enough press for some reason. Why won't the general public get as excited about cute monkey rhythm games as I do? 7 out of 10. Fallout New Vegas. The soundtrack for this game is literally always one of my most listened to playlists. Besides that, it's a pretty fun game, but I suck too much at video games to be able to get very far in it. I find the dialogue to be whimsical and entertaining, and there was always something fun to get wrapped up in. It just pretty much always ended in my death. Marvel Spider-Man PS4. The longer I spend with this rendition of Peter Parker, the more he grows on me. The animation and swinging mechanics in this game are truly stunning and a true feat that is beyond my mere mortal understanding of art. However, I've barely gotten very far in this one at all. Sonic Unleashed. For the longest time, I was really excited about starting Sonic Unleashed. Its Halloween and spooky aesthetics, as well as the mechanics present in the Werehog stages, were a breath of fresh air for me, since I hadn't seen anything like it from any other Sonic game I'd played this far. Actually, I preferred the day stages more than the night stages typically. Several of the songs from this soundtrack made it into my Spotify rap this year. Not only did I prefer the music that played during the day stages, but also the gameplay and environment. I just wish I had a little more time to take in those environments, but Sonic was going too freaking fast. Also, for those who are curious, I played the Wii version on a Wii U. I think it'd be fun to experience the Xbox 360 and PS3 versions hub worlds, but my resident Sonic expert swore that the Wii version was the superior version. Amy, Chip, and Sonic's characterization were my favorite parts about the game for sure. This is the kind of cheesy yet grounded Sonic characterization I prefer. I didn't finish this game, but I'd be open to trying to finish it if I get the time. Sonic Superstars. This game was very joyful for me. The thought of a multiplayer classic Sonic game sounds like it wouldn't work on principle, yet it didn't bother me too much, but I can imagine it being more annoying for those who are more competitive or serious. Okay, it did get kind of annoying always trailing behind my resident Sonic expert, but I got over it and just tried to keep up and enjoy it for the most part. Also, the difficulty spike was a little too sudden for me. It would have been nice to have one or two more stages in between in order to smooth out that curve a bit more. The animations and models of the characters in this game are just too cute. I adore them. Especially Tails. Look at him, he's just a little baby. I preferred playing as him the most. I barely ever play it as Knuckles because he's so damn slow. Thankfully, Amy was treated well here. She felt very smooth to play. Also, the environments were all so lively. Their colors truly popped. And they got really creative with some of the stage's mechanics. Do not spoil those who haven't played the game yet. Most of the most amusing ones had to do with time limits, as a hint to which ones I'm referring to. If you're curious, my partner and I have a whole playthrough of this game over on his channel. It's goofy. It's a riot, it's a good time, so go and watch it if you want to see me cry and do a terrible Tales impression. 7.9 out of 10. Jet Set Radio! Jet Set Radio is one of the most purely fun experiences I've had from a video game ever. The voice delivery, camera work, and OST all combine to create the quintessential 2000s color splashed gaming experience. Learning to control my skates, speed, and control was incredibly satisfying. The adrenaline I felt after finally clearing a really tough stage was akin to the feeling of beating a special super hard boss in a JRPG. No, maybe it even surpassed that. You might be asking why this game isn't scored higher. Well, the answer is quite literally yet again that I suck and I'm not skilled enough to progress any further in the game despite practicing and retrying over and over for literal hours. During certain stages, it felt like this game wanted you to be frame perfect and it tests whether you've truly mastered your skills on the streets. 8.5 out of 10. Paranormousite. Paranormousite was truly astounding from what I've played of it. It's a horror visual novel about the seven mysteries of Hanjo, a cursed story that is heavy on suspense and mystery. It really pulls out all the stops it can to impress and spook you, granted its medium as a video game. Sometimes it got a bit frustrating having to restart a section many times if I couldn't figure out a solution, but it was usually satisfying to finally find the answer and escape death. Its writing and world building is simply spectacular. I felt so immersed exploring the dark city streets. The painting style illustrations were unique and eye-catching, and the static TV visual effects were a nice touch. I didn't finish this game, but I really do want to see how the story plays out from where I left off. Sonic Heroes. Sadly, this is another one I didn't finish, 
English, but I made a real effort to get as far as I could. Before picking it up this year, I only had a vague idea of what Sonic Heroes was from a memory of after-school latchkey, watching other kids take turns playing it before their parents came to pick them up. So, since it had been about 17 years since I saw the game proper, you can imagine I misremembered a few things. I had the most fun with Team Sonic and Team Rose, and it was fun to see how the members of Team Dark play off of each other in this era of Sonic the Hedgehog. I also gained a love for SPO thanks to this game, so that's something to note. The bingo stages really sucked in this game. They're so infuriating. Same with the final boss. The stage with the froggy stealth missions and evil amphibians and the rail grinding train canyon were two of the most memorable stages for me. They certainly tried something new here with Sonic Heroes. Even though it was experimental, it worked for the most part. I was prone to frustrations here and there, but overall I was laughing and smiling from zipping around and listening to each character speak. I really remember loving Link Tails' my head spinning line, Sonic Colors Ultimate. It's been just about as long since I'd seen Sonic Colors. I had never actually played it myself. The memories I had of the title were of watching my little brother play the stages here and there. He was practically obsessed with the thing. Back when I was a child, I would groan whenever he replayed Reach for the Stars for the thousandth time in my dad's van at 7 in the morning on the way to school off of a burned CD of illegally downloaded YouTube MP3s. Now I love that song. It even makes me cry now. This may just be my favorite soundtrack from any Sonic game. Aquarium Park has always banged, and I now love the other acts' music as well. I was ecstatic to jump into Sonic Colors and revisit it for myself, as much as my resident Sonic expert warned me about its writing. And oh man, playing it as an adult really makes me understand just how goofy the writing in this game is. As a kid, I kind of thought nothing of it, since first of all, this was like the first Sonic I ever met, and I built my expectation for what he is around this. Baldy McNose hair. Coming back to it from the perspective of an adult Sonic fan, I now realize how much whiplash Sonic fans must have felt back in the day when they booted this game up on the Wii for the first time and got this. Sometimes it made me smile, especially when Tails was on screen too. Once again, I wished for more of Sonic's friends to be in the game, because it would be funny to see how they would have butchered their characters in this game to be honest, but playing the game itself was a blast. It really lives up to the name. It's bright, colorful, and visually stimulating all the way through. Little goody two shoes. My god, if you haven't played this game yet and you're a fan of 90s anime aesthetics, you absolutely need to try it. Its art direction is so gorgeous. I would say this is what should have won best art direction at the Game Awards for real. The UI and environments are so ornamental and the blending of the gorgeous pixel character animation overlaid on top of them is just executed with such class. The music also pairs perfectly with the game's world. Other than strictly visuals, this lesbian horror romance sucked me in. Freya is absolutely best girl. The Muffy spying mechanics, job mini games, and time management gameplay loop were pretty fun to try to learn to get used to. They definitely were engaging, since things could really take a turn for the worse quickly if you didn't stay on top of those things. I also loved playing as Elise. I found that playing as an arrogant protagonist that isn't a very good person was a nice change of pace. The game spooked me sometimes with light jump scares, but it's not all that scary for a horror game. That's better for me as someone who gets creeped out real easily, but it might be a deal breaker for you. But you should at least give it a shot for the creativity and artistry alone. Some of the puzzles were frustrating and had confusing controls, so that's something to be aware of. There's like 10 different endings to try for too. I only played through it once, sadly, and the ending I got definitely wasn't a very good one to be honest. It all seemed to end too quickly in a way. I would have to replay it one day to see if my opinion on a different ending changes. 8.5 out of 10. Night in the Woods. I played Night in the Woods on and off over the course of the past year. It was one of those games that I always could only play during a night I couldn't sleep. For a while, it was kind of medicine for me. There are only a few games I've played that have that same effect. I finally finished it just a little before autumn actually hit. If you can find a brisk fall day to start this game, I highly recommend you play it at that time. May was unfortunately kind of a relatable protagonist as a fellow 20 something. I really resonated with the dialogue of this game. It really hits you where it hurts at times. As events transpired, it always kept me guessing. It really escalates more than you would expect from a game with silly cut out animals walking around. It even gets pretty creepy. 9 out of 10. Spider-Man Miles Morales. I had no doubt that I would enjoy Spider-Man Miles Morales going into it this year. I started and finished it before I began Marvel Spider-Man actually. Miles, along with his family and friends, make New York come alive in a way that was special in this game. His swing tricks, quips, and style glued me to his character and the adventures he would get himself wrapped up in out of a responsibility he holds. I didn't want to put this one down. It took all that was effective gameplay-wise about Marvel's Spider-Man 
Spider-Man and amplified it. By the time I reached the climax of the story, I really felt like I earned the title of the Hero of Harlem. It was satisfying watching Miles grow from the beginning to the end of the game. One of my favorite moments that stuck in my memory is definitely exploring Miles' home during Christmas time and walking around the Puerto Rican culture festival, and saving Spider-Man the cat, of course. 8.8 out of 10. Octodad, Dadliest Catch. For some reason, my friends had been trying to get me to play Octodad for like a year, maybe longer. The idea of the game never really impressed me that much. What more to it is there other than silly quap-like maneuvers, and I shrugged it off day after day. Somehow, for almost a full decade, I had been missing out on one of the best gaming experiences 2014 had to offer. Though short, Octodad Dadliest Catch is a damn near perfect game from start to finish. To my surprise and delight, the clunky yet simple controls only added to the overall gameplay experience. Dare I say this is peak lighthearted family comedy. Certainly one of the most charming games I have ever played. Second to a hat in time. Danganronpa Eden's Garden Volume 0. Yes, it's the only fan game I have on my list this year. If you're a fan of Danganronpa and you haven't heard about Eden's Garden, allow me to enlighten you. A dedicated fan group has been working on their very own Danganronpa fan game for quite some time now, and they were finally able to release a play prologue to the general public last year. And yes, that includes me, so I was able to experience this fantastic fan game for the first time as well. From what I've gathered of the art style, UI, and game flow in the prologue so far, this game truly pays proper homage to the Danganronpa series. If you had asked me to determine if this was a fan game or a legitimate Danganronpa sequel, I genuinely would have thought it was a proper sequel. This game is oozing with quality. Thank you to the development team behind this game for allowing me to experience the excitement of playing a new Danganronpa game for the first time again. You all are incredible for making that happen. Though I found every character intriguing, I especially love Diana. So much so that I drew some fan art of her shortly after completing the prologue. I won't spoil who it is, but the villain of this game is actually intimidating and is definitely a change of pace from the usual scheming monochromatic bears. Please try out this game and support its development. I hope that as more chapters are released, this game will be up higher in the rankings on next year's list. Nancy Drew, The Deadly Device. If there's one thing I haven't explicitly shared about me on this channel yet, it's that I'm hella nostalgic for these mega old Nancy Drew point and click computer games. I loved playing them with my brother and dad after school, solving puzzles and pretending to be kinda smart, but actually solving these puzzles still takes me way too long even as an adult. And it's always kind of a special moment when you find someone else out there who actually remembers these games. And it's even more exciting if you find someone who actually still plays and enjoys them, like myself. You see, there is a lot of Nancy Drew games. 33 to be exact, not including spin-off games. So I didn't get through all of them within the time frame of my childhood existence. Some of them kind of slipped through the cracks. Especially this one, that has a heavy emphasis on science and mathematic puzzles. Once I got over the fact that my brain shuts off whenever I see a number, though, I found out that this game's story and characters are one of the best in the Nancy Drew series. Thankfully, I had my super smart partner help me solve all of the complicated binary and chemistry puzzles so I could just sit back and enjoy the show. It was really entertaining watching the characters interact, because each one of them were fully under the impression that they could never be wrong ever. And that is a recipe for disaster if I've ever seen one. Mason was the worst and the best of them all. Though Mason is the biggest asshole in the Nancy Drew franchise, that's exactly what makes him so memorable and entertaining to bug over and over. At times I was convinced he really was going to just storm out in front of me or hit me with his precious 3D printer. How do you feel, Mason? How do you feel knowing I moved one singular pen from its perfectly perpendicular position on your desk? Also, the fact that this is a murder mystery alone sets it apart from the other Nancy Drew games. The stakes are a lot higher here and it really helps immerse you into the lab. Still not as scary as Shadows at the Water's Edge, but it was a good effort. Okay, Nancy Drew nerding is over now, I promise. 8.8 out of 10. Dave the Diver. My history with fishing games is a brief one, yet filled with love. Dave the Diver gave me the gift of the adrenaline one feels when trying to catch a giant shark, and that's a present I won't take for granted. There's much to be explored under the sea with Dave. Finding a new species made me feel electrified, because it meant I was able to try a new recipe at the Sushi Bar Diner Dash-esque minigame during the nighttime segments. I was even able to help out my homie by recovering his precious waifu figure from the seafloor that he dropped and had stolen by a giant sea monster. I always had a tendency to play this game right after a long day at work as soon as the moon had risen. Playing this game was soothing to my soul. I really appreciated playing as a plus-sized protagonist as well. However, it wasn't always a walk in the park. The game has its fair share of challenges, and you definitely need to manage your oxygen and weapon upgrades efficiently. But to me, that's a good thing. 
some challenges needed to keep you invested. Sadly, I never truly reached this game's end, but I'd be happy to pick it back up to see what more it has in store for me as soon as I find the right time. Needless to say, Dave the Diver's characters are overflowing with charm, and you should absolutely play it if you need a feel-good game to help you unwind at the end of the day. 8.5 out of 10. Space Channel 5. I think more games today need to be more like Space Channel 5. We need more games with wacky concepts that sound like you made them up while trying to tear yourself out of a three-month-long writer's block, but executed with the fervor of a werehog unleashed. Game developers, I want you to take an idea as unhinged as a slayful space reporter saving her people from alien invaders with the power of dance and go at it. Hopefully your game will have better input sensitivity than the Sega Dreamcast. 10 out of 10. Panya. Golf is probably the number one most boring sport of all time, but if you slap a bunch of low poly anime girls and 240p JPEG sunsets into a golfing game, of course I'm gonna love it. Panya simply hits different. Half the fun of the game is customizing my multiple characters and doing little default dances under the cherry blossom trees, and I'm not afraid to admit how enjoyable that was, especially with friends. There's an absolute bucket load of adorable outfit pieces and accessories to mix and match, as well as other cute customizable golfing accessories themed with anime that was popular over a decade ago. I never had the chance to experience the magic of Panya in its prime when the game was still ongoing. Thankfully, I was able to play it unofficially online, and with everything already unlocked, too. 10 out of 10. The murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm not a veteran Sonic enjoyer, but I am a cringe one. Maybe I did think it was strangely mind-readery when this point-and-click mystery Sonic game was released on April Fools. I mean, it sounds like the least likely thing to come out of the franchise besides a dating sim, right? And that's what I loved about it. It gave me a chance to connect with these lovable characters on a narrative level. I appreciated seeing their personalities mesh in ways I hadn't seen before from the main games. I even got to learn a bit about the memes in the Sonic community. The fact that Tails, Amy, and the rest of the cast had so much time in the spotlight was a breath of fresh air. As much as I love Sonic himself, I love the rest of them too. Tails truly proved himself to be the greatest, silliest, cutest detective there is. Please play this game if you're a Sonic fan and you haven't already. 10 out of 10. Sonic R. See, contrary to popular belief, a video game doesn't need to be Red Dead Redemption levels of full to be considered good. Call me easy to please, but I had much more fun playing this silly little hedgehog racing game compared to most of the other games I've played this year combined. Of course I have to mention the soundtrack of this game, it's like one of the only soundtracks featuring this specific vibe, and one of the only ones that features a female singer for every track on the album. What a win! Now to assess the game itself, it's just pure fun. Look at this guy just running around everywhere, look at him go, that's our friend. What a stellar guy. The race against metal knuckles is permanently stamped onto my skull for how egregiously difficult it was. What do you mean I need to be frame perfect? glitching through the map. Oh my god, this game is on crack. 10 out of 10. Fashion Dreamer. What more can I say about Fashion Dreamer? It was what gave my channel a massive boost in viewership this year, yet it was unfortunately probably the single most disappointing video game release of my entire life. I'm still happy it exists, and it makes my heart feel joy when I play it, but I also feel hollow inside when I'm reminded about what the game could have been if it had more time and care put into it. 7 out of 10. Master Detective Archives Raincode. Everyone knows it's difficult to best your best work. I feel that many people thought that was the problem Kodaka ran into with this one-off when he was creating it. The question that arises too often with this game is, how does it compare to Danganronpa, Kodaka's previous work? In my opinion, Rain Code certainly stands on its own as a complete impressive work. I fell in love with Yuma, Kurumi, Shinigami, and many of the other characters. Some of them were really hateable, but that was the case for Danganronpa 2, to be honest. Even my boyfriend, who isn't usually into these types of plot-heavy mystery games, kept asking us to continue playing it together to see where the story went. If it kept him invested, I'm sure it'll capture a lot of your hearts too. So if you for some reason missed this one, absolutely give it a try. It was one of the most enjoyable and creepy stories I was able to experience this year, and I'm sure it'll stay in my head for a long time past 2023. 10 out of 10. Crab Champions. Woo! 10 out of 10. Ooh, that was a lot of video games. All right, and you ready for me to talk about all the movies I watched this year? Cause I got that coming right at Tom Popo. I'll say that this Japanese film is simply a must watch for anybody who appreciates the power of a good meal. If you have a love for food and its natural ability to bring people together, you'll love the message of Tom Popo. I could barely be classified as an amateur cook, but it's the homey touch that this movie chooses to celebrate through a series of vignettes that'll have you laughing at one scene and tearing up at the next. Be prepared though, because I'm fairly certain that the director might have a food fetish. 8.7 out of 10. Cinemarella the movie. I'm just frankly happy that a movie this adorable exists. If you love the adorable Cinemarella, you're just guaranteed to have a good time watching this. 
It's bound to make you smile through the whole experience. The plot is nothing groundbreaking or particularly memorable, but it's a great time watching it with your fellow Sanrio enjoyers. 7.8 out of 10. Shaun of the Dead. For me, it's hard to go wrong with an Edgar Wright film. There were some moments in this movie that truly aged horribly, but overall it was a highly entertaining, zany zombie comedy, and we don't get a ton of those of this quality. Highly recommend it if you're looking for a more lighthearted, silly horror experience. 9 out of 10. Hush. I watched this movie one night after driving 6 hours to visit my friend in Tennessee. She's a massive horror buff, and recommended we give this one a shot. We were delighted to find a film that asked questions we found other movies hadn't before, and one that featured a girl boss, death, and mute woman as the starring role. She was seriously a badass up against the masked murderer, and it was a very gripping watch and made me really want to root for the lead. 8.5 out of 10. The Shining. This is another classic horror film I never felt brave enough to watch alone. Finally, in 2023, I had the chance to watch it, and it truly lives up to its fame. I will say it's a long one, so you kind of have to be prepared to get invested, but it is so worth it. This movie has many of the best examples on how to create a truly creepy atmosphere. Plus, the ending culminates into an incredible twist that keeps you asking questions even after the credits roll. It also features plenty of gorgeous long camera shots and old hotel scenery. Now that I've seen it, I always recommend it to those who haven't. Whenever I do get the chance to rewatch it, I feel as if this film puts me in a trance and I can't look away. 10 out of 10. Scream 6. The only thing I had written in my notes for this movie was a bunch of question marks. I don't know what I really expected from Scream 6, since on one hand it was a singular sequel film, in a series of movies from a long-running horror franchise, and we all know how those typically turn out. But also, the original Scream is probably my favorite classic horror film. Overall, it was fun to watch in the theater with my friend, and that's about it. 5.5 out of 10. 16 Candles. Even though this is labeled as a classic, I barely even remember the plot of this film. The stereotypical racist jokes and sexist humor did not help this movie age well. The only thing I liked about it was Molly Ringwald. 3 out of 10. Pretty in Pink. I enjoy Pretty in Pink, but honestly it kind of frustrates me. All of Molly Ringwald's potential love interests are just kind of awful. She doesn't really deserve that, especially not as the character she plays in this film. I enjoyed the thoughtfulness that went into the discussions of differences in class dynamics and how it affects one's status and worth in the social construct nightmare prison known as school. If you're going to watch any 80s movie starring Molly Ringwald, let it be this one. 8 out of 10. The Super Mario Brothers movie. I was just as confused as to why Chris Pratt was yet again cast to voice act a character that makes no sense for him, but at least the rest of the movie was enjoyable. I think it's more of a faithful movie adaptation of Super Mario, visually and plot-wise, in that it wasn't so heavy, and that's what Miyamoto has wanted for the franchise and history. And no, I don't prefer it that way, but that's an entirely separate conversation for another day whenever I feel like delving into my love for a Paper Mario. But yes, as expected, Peach was the star of the show for me in this film, and you should watch it just for her, if anything. Even if you're just vaguely a fan of Mario. Jack Black's performance as Bowser was incredible, and I hope it is never forgotten and is celebrated for years to come. Probably the most genius casting Illumination could ever hope to achieve. 8.5 out of 10. The Amazing Spider-Man. I enjoyed this movie, but I didn't even remember the name of Dr. Curtis Connors, yet I remember the fact that he turned into a big lizard man. 7 out of 10. Down With Love is a satirical roller coaster ride through 1962. I don't think this movie is trying to make any big message, but I believe it's just meant to be a silly comedy that plays too much into gender stereotypes to be culturally relevant in the present day. That being said, the costume design, planning, shots, and execution are to be applauded, I believe. The musical number at the end took me for a spin. Well appreciated. 8 out of 10. Spider-Man 3. At some point, the Spider-Man films begin to blend together for me, but I was excited about this one, especially knowing the impact this film had had on meme culture in the 2000s. Spider-Man is certainly at his silliest here, and arguably his most pompous. The black suit and Venom look much cooler in this movie than in the newer films, in my opinion. I like the over-the-top CGI look, it makes me feel nostalgic. 7 out of 10. Across the Spider-Verse. My partner and I had been looking forward to this one for a while. I would have to say it was worth the wait. I'm happy to say this was the film we were able to see together for the first time. Spider-Verse set a new standard for animation in the film industry, and I think that's a massive win. I think it's annoying when other movies blatantly copy the style of Spider-Verse, but I'm glad it redefined to the public how magical animation can be. Also, this movie had one of the best, creepiest villains I've seen in a while. My partner and I are patiently waiting for part two. 10 out of 10, Venom. This was a silly one for sure. I'm pretty sure it'd be more suited for an edgier person. The Eminem feature at the end has turned into a meme between my partner and I. 6 out of 10. Venom. Let there be carnage. 
The only thing I remember about this sequel is that there was a bloody, edgy guy in prison or something. Also, Carnage's screams were ear-piercing, and I feel bad for anyone who had to experience listening to it in an overly loud theater. 5 out of 10. Just one of the guys. Joyce Heiser's masculine transformation was so flawless. I'm sure it awakened something in so many people. The men in this movie are ridiculous, though. I almost feel bad that the actors were forced to deliver some of these lines. It also sucks that Joyce Heiser was basically forced to record that one scene that everyone remembers because it's so out of pocket. I can't show it on YouTube, if you get what I mean. But it sure is of its time, that's for sure, for better and for worse. 7 out of 10. The Barbie Movie. I watched The Barbie Movie twice. On the second watch, I noticed a few more questionable things that unfortunately bothered me more than on the first watch. The first time I experienced the film in the theater and was simply blown away by the gorgeous set, costume design, and music and choreography. Aesthetically, this may actually be one of my favorite movies. I mean, it's so pink. Everything goes with everything. The only place it falls flat for me is in some of the writing and the overall message. I get the argument that this is supposed to be baby's first feminist film, since it is a Barbie movie after all. I just have this pet peeve when it comes to movies about speaking your message blatantly to the audience. I don't like it when a movie assumes I or any other person is too numbskulled to piece together the meaning, so they spell it out for us, even if it is made for kids. Overall, I'm mostly just glad this movie exists. I almost cried at the powerful ending scene in the theater. Okay, maybe I did cry a little bit. I don't think there would be a day when I can ever watch that without it pulling at my heartstrings. And to think it'll only get worse as I get older. We'll see how people choose to remember this film as it ages. Me? I'll remember it as my top summer film of 2023. 9 out of 10. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. This is an absurdist, on the road type of film that barely ever gives you a break to process whatever is happening on screen at one time. I don't think I could be bored watching this film even if I rewatched it multiple times. With the liberties it takes, you can tell it's from 2004, but I kind of like that about it. 7.5 out of 10. Next, we'll move right along to the anime and TV shows I consumed this year, starting with Breaking Bad. I watched the first and second season of Breaking Bad and became quite invested in the story along with my partner. What I like most about this show is probably how it deals with Mr. Walter White and his character progression. His motivations make logical sense, and it's believable enough to be genuinely frightening at times. He hovers on the black and white of being a good and bad person so much in the first two seasons. I'm excited to see how drastically he changes in the coming episodes. Originally, my partner was insistent on never watching Breaking Bad for the meme. That is to say, since he referenced it so often, he thought it would be more funny if in actuality he never once saw a single episode. Thankfully, it was worth the time we put in to watch it. Just beware going into it if you're sensitive to violence. 8.8 .8 Turtles out of 10. Idolmaster U149. As a diehard fan of Cinderella Girls and the Idolmaster in general, I was always looking forward to the next episode of this anime. Unfortunately, the show went heavy on the episodic approach, similar to how the Love Live Nijigasaki anime is. I appreciated the fact that each idol had their episode shine, but I found that it simplified the characters and the connections between them too much. It also highlighted when certain characters received more impactful or quality episodes over others. Thankfully, it was still able to scratch my itch for Idolmaster anime each week. 7 out of 10. The Bachelorette Season 20. OMG, I had so much fun watching this season with my partner. Sorry, I can be a sucker for The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, especially when a season is actually good, like this one. We actually were able to predict who Charity would choose this time. Thank god it was who it was. No spoilers here. I felt like the silly drama was just enough in this season, and the rest of it was actually about encouraging and helping the lead find love. I beg that production takes this approach for further seasons because in my opinion this makes for much better television than screaming over alcohol. 9.7 red roses out of 10. Sonic Prime Season 2. Personally, I really enjoyed this season of Sonic Prime since it explored the intricacies of Knight's character and gave Shadow more of a spotlight in a way that wasn't just annoying to watch. I also thought Chaos Sonic was not only a fun character to watch but also to listen to. I liked listening to Devin Mac flex his range. Also, all of the versions of Amy in this show are cracked, and the way the characters are animated are really bouncy and adorable to watch. The twist at the end will have you more shook than the end of Infinity War. That's a half joke. 8 out of 10. Finally, let's move on to the manga section. We may be an inexperienced couple, but this is one of the cutest manga I've ever read. If you want something that will make your heart flutter, definitely read this one. It felt like it spoke to me the things that I needed to hear at the time when it comes to maintaining a relationship. The male lead is really dumb sometimes. 9 out of 10. Junji Ito's Cat Diary. 
This manga is certainly a unique depiction of average home life with cats, distinctive of a horror mangaka's style. It's a short but sweet read. Learning of his cat's personalities is amusing, especially if you're already a cat lover like myself. I bet you could enjoy this manga's comedic aspect even if you didn't like cats though. I appreciated the photorealistic pictures that were included in the book. 8.5 out of 10. Pink by Kyoko Okazaki. To be a woman is a strange thing. Never has this been illustrated more effectively than in Pink, a Jose manga about a call girl who owns a pet alligator that feeds on men. To me, this is a must read. 9 out of 10. I love Amy. My favorite part of this series is the author's art style. It's so adorable, I could just stare at it for hours. The plot and lesbian drama will keep you invested too, and it's one of my favorite reads of this year. 8.7 out of 10. And that was my year in media review. Hopefully you found something from this list worth watching or playing or just giving your time to. I hope they will inspire you and comfort you as much as they did me. Now it's your turn. If you'd like, let me know some of your favorite TV shows, anime, manga, and or games you consumed this year. If it's anything like the list above, I'll definitely want to check it out. Thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your 2024. Here's to a good one for once.